Alas, poor Gregory. <laughs> Hello friends, and Gregory, and welcome to the long-awaited part two. Onision's second book is called This Is Why I Hate You. Uh, it's commonly thought to be worse than Stones to Abigail, however I will say that the writing itself is definitely better. It has much less of the just bad fan fiction sort of writing style that characterizes Stones to Abigail. At times I would even call it slightly below average, which I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impressed by coming from him. However, that is where my credit towards this book ends. It's absolutely horrendous, as you would expect. Uh, Stones to Abigail at least had a concrete storyline and themes and was a cohesive thing. This one is really just garbage spewing in every possible direction, constantly contradicting itself. I really do think that he set out to write one book and then at some point got bored and started writing a completely different book. That is the only explanation for this. So let's begin. Our protagonist is yet again Greg. Uh, this time his name's Arthur. The protagonist of Stones to Abigail was named James. This one is Arthur. We don't care. It's Greg. <laughs> I believe that the most accurate reading of these books is that they're Greg's fantasies. His protagonists are just very obvious self-inserts and I will refer to them as Greg for that reason. This book is supposed to be his journal, which he keeps because nobody understands him. They're all just sheeple who could never understand how deep and enlightened he is. Basically the exact same shit as how the first book opened, except worse, honestly. This one is worse. It's better written, but it's overall a much worse experience. You'll see why. He's just he's just such a tortured soul. Um, it's so sad, and I'm willing to bet he has absolutely no problems, except for the ones he has created himself by being a narcissistic fuck that nobody wants to talk to. I'm an asshole and it's so hard for me is basically um, what I'm getting from this right now. So now we segue into a tangent about how life is meaningless and happiness disgusts him, which segues into a tangent about how he's a big rational atheist and praying is dumb. And if you pray, it makes you dumb. If you find joy and happiness in life, you're a big dummy. This is supposed to be a private journal, but we're already in, in the introduction and he has spoken directly to the reader multiple times. So, which to me just points to the fact that this, there's no way this would exist if there wasn't an audience for it. Like, I don't think he's capable of genuine self-reflection. Like, this is for an audience. So chapter one, Greg hates pretty much everything. He hates his room. He hates sunlight. He hates his father a lot. He hates Christianity, again, because that's a really important point to drive home, apparently. Big rational atheist, smart man, galaxy brain. He hates the English language itself. Uh, I got a little quote here for you. Verbal communication is key to committing genocide. You want world peace? Stop participating in this pointless social game. Commit yourself to silence. Statistically, you likely have nothing of value to say anyway. This is so fucking edgy, I am physically in pain. It sucks because I really do feel for teenagers who have social problems or feel like weirdos in a kind of closed-minded environment because that absolutely was me. It does make you sad and angry and hostile towards normal people, but you grow up and you realize that the world is so much bigger than high school and that there is a place in it for you. But I feel like the problem here is that Greg has never realized that the world is bigger than high school. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, welcome to this video. I don't know why you're watching me suffer, but <laughs> this man is in his 30s. So this is real sad. And not in like a genuine, I, I cry, like no, he's a horrible human being, I'm, it's sad as in like, oh god, yikes. Now he fantasizes about murdering and torturing this kid he doesn't like. He calls people a lot of really horrendous things. Uh, he mentions this girl, the first thing that he tells us about her is that she has huge boobs and is destined to be a stripper. Hatred of women for their sexual power, interesting. Uh, and the next thing he mentions is that she has the mind of an 11 year old. So that's your big yikes of the day, not that it'll be the last. We have found one thing that our boy Gregory does not hate. It's ham sandwiches. He also tells us that he is not concerned with his health because he's thin. Uh, and he hates his father who actively tries to better himself and his health uh, considers himself superior to his father because his father is heavier than him. Interesting. Greg nicely acknowledges for us, so self-aware, he acknowledges that he has a, uh, 
what does it say? Irrelevant first world white boy life. But here's the thing, someone truly nihilistic is not gonna write an entire book about how everything in the world is just disgusting and beneath you, except for ham sandwiches, apparently. Basically, I'm reading from notes that I made as I read the book, so there is this whole big reveal at the end, we'll get there, there's this whole big reveal about his relationship with his father at the end, which is supposed to recontextualize all of this and make it impossible to criticize him, but it's just such a cop-out and just such a weird thing tacked on at the end. So I wrote all of this down when I didn't know that, and I, I have a bit of a feeling that Greg wrote this book without knowing that either. He just tacked it on at the end to make it harder to criticize him, so we're gonna keep reading this entire book until like the last page where they reveal it. We're gonna keep reading this book as if that's not a thing that he says. Chapter two. He has a dead mother and uh, he doesn't hate her apparently. So, so far we've got dead mom, ham sandwiches. Um, he then fantasizes about bombing a sports event because human life is worthless and it would be a laugh, I guess. Um, Sports are another thing which are apparently beneath him. Geez, dude, it's not our fault that you have no talents or hobbies in life and other people enjoy things. Like, wow, people are successful at sports and millions of other people find joy in watching them? Sounds terrible, what's an empathy? But no, he makes sure to assure us that he's not a sociopath because he, he would never actually murder anyone. He just loves fantasizing about it all the time, which sounds totally legit. He's also dating this girl named Ashley for the sole reason that she seems to like him and he has a physical need. And we quote, Ashley is a good looking girl. She is pale skinned. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but we are just gonna throw away the entire suitcase. Also, free will doesn't exist because teenage boys are horny. Uh, love is fake. Your body decides to pursue relationships, not your big boy galaxy brain, of course. If I had free will, I could choose to be gay. And I just fucking might. He then uses the word impregnate repeatedly, which I is up there with moist in my opinion. Uh, and love in quotation marks to multiple times in quotation marks to describe his feelings towards potential children that he might have which uh, He wrote this as a father. So that's just take that as you will No, 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 he also likes about Ashley that she is healthy read thin uh, and has good facial proportions and wait for it this is the time to call on your knowledge from the last book. How well do you know Greg's bullshit? His favorite thing about her is that she has no opinions that could possibly challenge his worldview in any way. This all sounds so incredibly ridiculous, but I promise you I'm not doing any interpretation here. This is what he says. I'm literally just reciting a summary of this book. I, I, I almost feel like he's doing my job at making fun of him for me. It's quite convenient, honestly. He decides he's gonna attack this jock we're back to jocks, apparently. He decides to attack this jock uh, for touching Ashley's hips without consent, which is a creepy thing to do, I will give you, but apparently, like, we've already, we've already been over the evils of language, so I assume, like, the only other way to solve your problem is by fighting him, so, uh, good big boy galaxy brain logic there. Greg acknowledges that starting this fight is primitive and marking his territory, which is absolutely disgusting, but it's again this like fake self-awareness because he's obviously gonna do it anyway because he wants to and he has like some like bullshit attempt at rational explanation for it, but like really he's just super hyped to hurt someone. Like that's it. He threatens to stab another jock friend of the guy's in the throat and then breaks the guy's arm and we quote, the snap of his arm was rather loud, surprisingly so. I might just have felt arousal from how tremendous it was. So yes, now our boy Gregory Onion gets real horny um, at breaking the arms of men who threaten his territory. This is our romantic hero who we are meant to root for. Thanks. Our reasoning for why he knows how to break arms is that his mom taught him this before she died, which, you know, sometimes you just teach your son how to break people's arms. I'm gonna teach my son that soon too. The principal shows up and Greg pretends to be the victim and then the police show up and he apparently convinces them too that it was self-defense even though there was a witness there who saw him start the fight who he threatened to stab in the throat but that's not important right now because he needs to be this big manipulative genius who has control over every situation. Ashley won't talk to him but that's okay because every girl is the same and he can just find another one exactly like her. Human life is worthless, the usual. 
Uh, this is honestly getting tiring. Chapter four, Ashley likes him again, big surprise. Buckle up my homosexuals, cause this next part is gonna get real incelly. A lot of people wonder why girls like jerks. Why are a lot of women into guys with attitude problems? Over the friend zoned nice boys. <laughs> if you appreciate reality over fantasy, it takes one look at the animal kingdom to figure out, yeah, it's that bad. The alpha male shall spread his seed. You know what else is absolutely necessary to survive in both human and animal society? Social bonds. Where are you gonna get by throat punching everyone in your path? Also, just glazing over the fact that the whole alpha male study was complete bullshit anyway, but. So I've written down, <laughs> I've written down here in my notes, He's like if an incel managed to touch a boob once and decided he was the ultimate enlightened Chad, which is, that's, that's pretty much how I'll put it, yeah. He's at home and he gets irrationally offended by his father saying that he's gonna pray for him because of his school troubles, um, and his father is out with his girlfriend a lot lately, so Greg uses that time alone in the house to masturbate constantly. He's very proud of his big boy self for getting around the parental blocks that his dad has on his computer to block the porn sites. Greg then shows up to school wearing a bloody trench coat and with half his face painted like a skeleton. This is where the cover of the book comes from, I guess. I like to read this moment like one of those bad fan fiction scenes where it's just gratuitous description of their outfits. Like my immortal has so many of them. Every other person in school has been looking at me nervously for the past few days. Today their looks could be in response to the fact that I painted half my face like a skeleton. It could also be that I wore the same trench coat I had on when I broke John's arm. I didn't even wash my own blood off of it yet. It could also be the silver tooth I got to replace the one John knocked out of my face. My name is Gregory Darkness Dementia Ravenway. <laughs> so Gregory gets called to the principal's office for his interesting fashion choices and is greeted with the question, are you a psychopath? We've been through stones to Abigail. We know that none of the adults in this book are gonna converse like normal mature adults. So the principal is like, I bet you're just being rebellious because your parents are stupid which is obviously because they're religious, because religious people are stupid. And Greg is like, no, wrong. My mom is dead and I liked her. And the principal's like, okay, cool. I'm gonna expel you because you're a psychopath, which makes total sense. Greg tells us, the reader, that this must be because he looks like a school shooter, acknowledges the Columbine reference with the trench coat, but he also takes deep offense to this because even though he looks that way, he would never hurt anyone just because he felt like it, even though he literally just did that. And then Greg goes and cries about it, but it's okay because he's ashamed of it, so he's still manly. This is this book is, at this point, just goth stones to Abigail. So Greg goes and takes off his makeup and wallows in self-pity and, oh, he's such a tortured soul, the world is so cruel to him, it's so tragic he must experience consequences for breaking people's arms and implying that he's a school shooter. So yeah, Greg doesn't have any friends, so he has to go sit with Ashley's friends at lunch. Her friends are brain dead and he wants to stab them, the usual. Uh, why in the legitimate fuck is this girl still dating him? There was no explanation as to why Ashley was even hanging around these people. No! There's no explanation for why she's still hanging around you. He tells her they have to leave immediately because her friends are stupid. And she picks her friends over him like a normal person should. So he storms away and flips them off. What are the chances that she's gonna chase after him and realize he's right and that she should worship the woke alpha male that he is? The chances are 100%. She calls him that night, big shock, and he gives her an ultimatum that he will take her back if she becomes goth. <laughs> Ashley stood where she knew I'd see her as I walked in. Her hands were interlocked in front of her thighs. Her butt was slightly perked out. I noticed this because she was wearing black tights. As her eyes came clearly into view, I could see her purple eyeshadow, plum colored lipstick, and purple glitter on the black jean jacket she was wearing. I was overwhelmed by her gesture of loyalty. I never- Greg's type continues to be girls who do whatever he wants mindlessly. Cute! He talks about her loyalty a lot, which is- totally not creepy and doesn't sound like a cult leader in any way, but I don't think we have to worry. He's already pursued that career path and it didn't work out so well. They decide not to use a condom and it's super romantic apparently. And he's like, you know, before I thought love was fake and I still do, but our relationship is different because I'm hashtag deep and different. As a writer, he needs to reconcile the protagonist being an edgy, cool psychopath with there also being a brain dead love interest that he can bang. Chapter seven. So Greg is real mad that his dad is taking them on a family trip that his dad's girlfriend wanted to go on because his dad is picking his girlfriend over him and that's so unfair because it impedes his ability to hang out with Ashley instead of his parents. How dare you pick your girlfriend over me? That impedes my ability to pick my girlfriend over you. He uses really horrible degrading language for his dad's girlfriend. Again, 
basically just because she's chubby. So Greg decides to blast some anti-religious screamo music to piss them off, refuses to turn it off like a little shit, and he's so proud of himself because now he's the big alpha male in the car and they can't do anything about it. So, uh, again, like a rational adult, a normal person. His dad decides to pull over and start choking him. Obviously, Greg fights back with his epic moves that his dead mother inexplicably taught him. And his dad's girlfriend tries to help by, like, pulling off Greg's boots so he can't kick as effectively. And then Greg just runs off into the distance and gets stranded because they were on a road trip. I'm just... This, okay, this is like, a, this is a bad fanfiction quality scene. It's not as saturated with bad fanfiction quality scenes as Stones to Abigail, but they are absolutely there, do not get me wrong. According to Greg, his father completely screwed him over in life because he never told him to be himself. My dad wanted me to grow up and have the same values as him. No shit, parents are like that sometimes. My parents wanted me to grow up to be straight and look how that turned out. But you know what, Greg, sometimes, People can deal with their differences in mature ways and come to an understanding. Anyway, Greggy e. Pooh gets arrested and put in juvenile hall. According to him, teenagers are like actual slaves, just the property of their parents with no rights. He's so oppressed, even though his father decides not to press charges or even impose any of his own punishments, it seems like. Literally, his life just goes exactly back to the way it was before, except he and his father don't talk anymore, which you'd think would be a positive for him. Chapter 8, Greg's life is falling apart, the tragedy! Greg makes the interesting claim that he has slept with Ashley more times than his father has ever slept with his own girlfriend. Probably because he's the real big alpha male in the house. Um, yeah, also his father doesn't want him and Ashley seeing each other because he's afraid that she'll get pregnant, which considering he's secretly read Greg's journal and knows that they don't use condoms, it's a completely valid concern. But he's still bad because he's a chubby beta male who believes in God like some kind of pussy. I've done my fair amount of criticizing religion on this channel, but specifically for the harm and depression it causes. I've made a video with one of my friends who is religious talking about our mutual problems with the Catholic education that we had growing up. I don't criticize religion because I'm personally offended that people dare believe something I think is illogical and I gotta flex my big galaxy brain on them. Like, no, this is absurd and childish and ridiculous. Also, the only good thing in life is having sex with his girlfriend, as usual. Greg then foreshadows additional tragic stuff which he has not mentioned, but it happened in the past, and he will mention it in the future, because good storytelling. This next passage is probably my favorite part in this entire book. Prepare your mind, body, and soul, as you do. As for the madness that went down recently, the other night I was called down to consume a meal that was prepared by Frogface, and I just happened to not be hungry. The dish of curse. <laughs> he meant of course, but it's hilariously fitting. The dish of curse was vegetarian. <laughs> it wasn't even the kind of bearable vegetarian. Rather, the type of vegetarian food you eat that makes people wonder if there's something wrong with you. Let me elaborate on that. Please do. If there are some vegetarian foods that I find somewhat decent tasting, they're called vegetables. Then there are these fake cheeses vegans invented that taste essentially like your grandmother crapped into a jar of flour, sprayed it with a hose, put it in the oven, ran over it with her car, put it back in the oven, blended it up, and put it under the sun to dry, and then slapped it on a veggie burger. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I mean, vegan cheese is kind of bad, but you can just not eat it. I don't want to eat their fake cheese just because they want to try something different than cow pus dairy. Of course someone with a spine would object, so I did. What happened as a result? Insanity. I'm picturing they just served him like an entire plate of cheese. Like, come down for dinner, son. It's just vegan cheese. So Greg gets up to leave this apparent feast of vegan cheese and his father calls the cops. This is just not a real person and neither is the officer who shows up and threatens to arrest him for having a bad attitude about vegan cheese. That's my favorite part. That's the best part. You may as well click off this video now. That's the best part. So Greg's new life plan is to join the Air Force, which sounds familiar. He decides to leave and Ashley takes that as him abandoning her. She seems to be upset by it, but he doesn't really care because all girls are the same and he can find another 
soulless person to fuck, I guess. He makes fun of all the guys who don't get accepted into the military because they're not alpha enough and they must be victims who feel bad for themselves all the time. You know, like I do constantly, but I'm completely unself aware about. All the guys applying, according to him, they're all running from something. But Greg's situation is by far the worst, definitely the worst of all of these people he doesn't know at all. And for certain, the most hashtag deep. He describes the process of traveling to the military facility in a lot of detail. Uh, and very clearly, probably because this is something that our esteemed author has experienced himself, we soon meet a woman called Sergeant Johnson. The first thing Greg tells us about her is that she is emotionally abusive to the troops, and the second thing he tells us about her is that he wants to gratify himself to her. Overall, he doesn't take very well to military discipline, but he complies with it to prove what an alpha male he is compared to all the weak others, because everyone is a stupid animal slave to emotions except for him. God, this bitch is tiring. I cannot stress to you how much of this book is just him going on about what a galaxy brain alpha male he is. The most frustrating thing is that at this part where he's talking about the military, there are, there are glimpses, there are moments where he does seem to know what he's talking about. And it it's frustrating because if he weren't such an insufferable narcissist, and this weren't all interpreted through the lens of how great he is, he could actually make an interesting point about some of these experiences. There's this one scene where, as a punishment for something he did, he has to taunt these other trainees that are doing push-ups, and he watches them gradually start to hate him and turn against him because they're in pain and he's taunting them, and he has this realization about manipulation. I guess I just found this scene weirdly believable in a way that I've never found anything in his books believable before. Um, so I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if it was based on a real experience. This would be an interesting scene if the point of it weren't all men are weak slaves who are below me. You know? This bitch is tiring is basically where I'm at with this book at this point. Chapter 10. So Greg decides to call Ashley and she's like, wait, who are you again? And he's like, um, I haven't been gone that long. And she's like, oh right, how could I forget the man I lost my virginity to? Because this is a normal conversation that two people would have that is definitely not contrived by a creepy old man to prioritize sex at every moment. So Ashley has moved on since he left, but... I mean, how long do you think that's gonna last? Like, we have not seen the last of her. There's there's no way she could stay away from Greg, the ultimate alpha male who she lost her virginity to. No, she's coming back. So they have this, like, surprise hostage situation drill where someone comes in and pretends to, like, take the trainer hostage, and none of the trainees do anything about it. And Greg reflects on what a coward he was and how he wants to be a big, brave, strong man. And my life is meaningless, but my existence can have more significance than this cowardly state if I let it. These things mean the opposite thing, and I am crying. I'm just- I'm clearly just too dumb to understand this absolute moral enlightenment. Chapter 11. Okay, so at this point I doubted my certainty about Ashley coming back because we have a new love interest. I'm sorry, I mean love, as Greg would say. So they're paired up for an exercise and Greg immediately knows that they were meant to be together because they're the only real people in a sea of drones. And at this point, my eyes are gonna fucking glaze over. So the exercise is like this suicide prevention simulation where they have to talk down a guy who wants to kill himself and all the other trainees fail because they're big stupids, not like Greg who just repeats, no, you have so much to live for a few times. It's time to stop. Okay, but wouldn't it be more in character for him to morally object to the whole exercise on the basis that human life is worthless and the guy deserves to die for being a weak beta male? Like, just putting that out there, just saying. So later he's talking to Cory, this is our new female specimen, and they're talking about their backstories, I guess, and she mentions that she wants- she joined the military so that she could pay for college. And in response to his backstory, she makes a joke that he's an uneducated delinquent or something. Um, and then she's like, no, just kidding, love you, you're so deep. Uh, girl, no. You had it right the first time, to run! So Greg concludes that this is where he belongs, his, his paradise, even. Because one, he gets to sadistically enjoy everyone else being miserable, and two, he has acquired a female. We enter chapter 12. There's some drama because Greg confronts a sergeant for violating a military code against using emasculating language on troops. I'm sure that does exist. However, it is pretty funny how he gets so enraged at a woman he must clarify to us that is he is not attracted to. He gets absolutely enraged at a woman he's not attracted to, insulting his masculinity. And I find that just hilarious. <laughs> really, I'm surprised he didn't just storm over to her and insist that it was all because she wanted to fuck him the whole time. But anyway, all the other troops side with the sergeant and he gets punished, kind of. They make him read the military code and see that it is allowed in a training environment, and he only read the excerpts in his booklet, 
but he doesn't consider himself wrong. He considers him he considers this such an unjust situation that he only read excerpts in his training booklet instead of the whole code. In fact, it's the military's fault for setting him up and deceiving him and for not treating him like a man. So everyone is a drone and he's oppressed for being punished for calling someone out for violating a code that he didn't read. Anyway, the solution is to fantasize about murdering people with chainsaws. Wow, being a raging narcissist sounds tiring. Imagine being this offended by shit. So he gets humiliated and socially ostracized, and the only person in the world who cares about him is his newest female of choice. You know, the usual. <laughs> Stop it. I would find his, his romance stories less ridiculous if it wasn't just exactly the same shit every time. There's like Abby in Stones to Abigail, Ashley, Corey, do they have distinct personalities? No, but that's clearly his ideal woman because they just they just stroke the onion ego endlessly without ever having to bother him with their own thoughts or feelings or opinions. So inconvenient, you know? Chapter 13. Nothing romantic has actually happened between him and Corey yet, but he gratifies himself to her literally every night. Literally. He has to use the word literally twice in a sentence to get this across. So they're stationed in Oklahoma now, but Greg keeps volunteering to be sent overseas because he just, he has this deep desire to help people and protect people now. Definitely not to commit mass murders because human life is worthless. Like, character development is a thing that happens, but it hasn't happened here. Like, in, in what situation did he realize that his previous worldview was flawed and develop in any way? He didn't. This, he just started saying the complete opposite of what he said the entire beginning of this book. And then he goes on for a while about the gross social rejects, because he's socially accepted at this base now, so he has the right to shit on the losers now, even though that's been him his entire life. Okay, so he says that some people are deliberately failing the tests to be sent overseas, or like the physical standards you have to meet, um, and he's just disgusted by that because they're clearly not brave alphas like him. Um, there's also a focus here on women who get pregnant to avoid service, but totally not because he hates women or anything. Definitely not. So Greg gets sent to South Korea, and as I was reading this, I thought that I vaguely remembered hearing somewhere that he had served in South Korea. So I looked it up and yes, he did, and he was also in Oklahoma. So this is very much based on his life. Corey gets sent somewhere actually dangerous, referred to only so eloquently as the desert. So she's really upset about it because obviously she only joined the military to pay for college and this is probably gonna be terrible and traumatic. She's very upset about it, but also totally, totally in love with Greg, even though he's the one who convinced her to apply to be sent overseas in the chances that they could be sent away together. They, we really glaze over the fact that he's the one responsible for this. So he tries to kiss her and she doesn't want to, but instead says that she loves him. Okay, chapter 15. So uh, Corey's being a little more distant now after what happened between her and uh, Greggy Poo, but because we can't go two seconds without talking about what a Chad he is, he gets an email from Ashley that says, I need you. So he calls her and she tells him that her brother is dead and he's like, what? And then she just yells at him for not knowing about the deadly mass shooting at their high school. Listen, my dudes, my friends, I think at this point we have to acknowledge as a fact Greg's disgusting fetishization of violence and tragedy. Like these sorts of violence and tragedy, such as school shootings, that the media makes glamorous in a way. So he immediately flies home to see Ashley, okay? Cause he's we have definitely established how much he deeply cared about her. So she picks him up at the airport and immediately starts making out with him and he feels bad about, what was it? He feels, feels bad for taking advantage of her sadness. I reiterate, at what point did this character develop human emotions? He just, he just cares so much about Ashley now and he wants to do whatever he can to ease her pain. Even though the last time they saw each other he didn't give a shit about never seeing her again and has since moved on to some other bland female with no personality. Wait. Nope, he's back on his bullshit. Evolution must have created the concept of love. Our relationships with other human beings were biologically invented to get us to live on and multiply. Love is simply a vessel used to deliver us a false sense of purpose and value. Congratulations, human species. You tricked us all into outliving our reproductive organs. That's all you wanted, right? Stick around till your junk stops working, then die. Cute. Problem is, the entire book's been full of this, and I am bored by this garbage, edgy 15-year-old bullshit. Greg looks at Ashley's brother's girlfriend, who's speaking at his funeral and crying. Like, he looks at this girl mourning her boyfriend and is like, yeah, she'll be fucking other guys in, like, maximum a month. But, like, totally not, because he hates women. Interesting how his opinions of them 
always come back to his approval or disapproval of their sex lives and how attractive they are to him. So Greg says that Ashley is basically just using him for sex as a coping mechanism, and he still thinks that love is fake, but he also doesn't care if he gets her pregnant, and he says that he loves her and he wants to take care of a family. <sighs> just, this boy is gonna give me fucking whiplash. So now we've got Ashley and we've got Corey, but he can't seem to make it work with either of them. Oh, whatever will he do? What if Corey doesn't find him physically attractive? Okay, I'm reading this with the foresight of what does happen, and what I wrote down is basically, um, that you won't see him actually get rejected in this book at any point. Um, and that still holds. You will, you will see the, the, the shit that he pulls, but that absolutely still holds. Well, what do you know? It's chapter 16. So, we're in Korea now. I made it for about a page and a half without making any notes, which tells me that this is the least insufferable chapter so far. He's describing the new trainer and the new sergeant and whatnot, and everything is relatively chill until he decides to pull some more psycho bullshit. They have this exercise where they have to fight a man in a big padded suit just as like a hand-to-hand -hand combat sort of thing, and everyone else fails to defeat the man in the padded suit. So Greggy Poo thinks up a fun little plan. He goes up, it's his turn, to fight the guy in the suit, and at first he just doesn't fight back like a smug little shit, and then when he gets the opportunity, he takes like a stick and jams it through the gaps in the faceplate, trying to seriously injure the dude, and succeeds. And he acknowledges at this point that the fight is clearly over, he has won by completely breaking the rules and actually hurting someone, but no. He decides just for kicks, he's gonna break the guy's ankle. This gives him chills of satisfaction, but then he's like, oh wait. I did a silly thing. I should hurt people I actually don't like. I, did, I didn't even know this random trainer, oops. I guess I just go a little crazy when I don't have anyone to fuck, you know? I'm just a guy with needs. Hurting people feels great. I either gotta hurt people or fuck to deal with my suffering. I'm just a guy out here with needs, just a normal guy. So the other trainers hear screaming and show up and they order some others to like hold Greg down, but they don't. They don't even listen to the order because they're too scared of Greg. To, they don't want to touch him. He's a big, scary alpha male. So the commander comes in and yells at Greg, and he's like, you know, like don't you think it's a it's a bit of common sense not to break other troops' ankles? It should be common sense, but we're not going to acknowledge how right the other guy is, of course, because this is Greg's story. The trainers and all the other students want him out of the army, but he just gets sent to a therapist and he's like, well, obviously they can't kick me out for being a good fighter. That would be stupid. Bullshit. Like an entire class witnessed him break the ankle of a man he'd already beaten in a fight when all of that was, a all of what he did was against the rules. And it's just like, again, common sense. You have to be absolutely deranged or stupid to do something like that. And he's just like, well, I'm just a good fighter. They can't kick me out. <laughs> Greg is very clearly in the wrong here, but it's it's subtext. He's, he's still our romantic hero tortured by the cruel world. It would be especially unreasonable if my discharge were a result of anyone thinking I'm too violent to be enlisted. Is that not what we're here for? The military is primarily just a weapon, plain and simple. Did they really expect every airman to go through combat training and be unable to destroy the man hiding behind the red man suit? That's the big padded suit the guy was wearing. We're only allowed to be killers and psychopaths when they put their stamp of approval on it, right? Otherwise, there's something wrong with us. Yes! Literally, yes! He's like, well, that's just stupid military logic for you. It's- there's, there's a good amount of logic to don't break your trainer's ankle because you felt like it. Chapter 18, and he's got another one. Oh, Gregory Onion. He's like, yeah, you know, I know that my entire life depends on a new girl every few months, but like, I have basic human needs. Be realistic. So the first thing he needs to tell us, the reader, about her is that he likes her ass. And the second important thing he needs to tell us is that she is not his race, but he's attracted to her anyway. What a saint. So, you know, he had his doubts, but he loves it in South Korea now because he's encouraged to be insane and violent, even though he literally just got in trouble for taking that too far, but okay. And he has another thing to fuck, so we're all good. Basic, basic human needs, violence and a female. We're set. But then one day, a senior airman decides to touch his girlfriend's hip. Also, he only refers to her as booty 
which is a totally endearing nickname that is not at all objectifying. It's just weird, I'm gonna call her his girlfriend. So Greg's like, that's my girlfriend actually. And then his girlfriend takes the opportunity to walk out of the room without saying anything. Just, just leave the situation because she's not important. Uh, and the other guy's like, well, I'm gonna fuck her anyway. And Greg's like, oh yeah, really bro? Well, I'll slit your throat. So the other guy threatens to extra sleep with his girlfriend and then murder her. And then Greg wakes up in a neck brace. So this guy comes into Greg's hospital room, Colonel Haas, same guy who lectured him before about it being kind of common sense to not break your trainer's ankle, but which was completely correct. But now he's totally on Greg's side because we want murderers in the military. That's the point, silly. I've been smelling some serious Greg bullshit for the past little while. At first I was like, yeah, I guess I'm not in the military and these all seem like feasible situations. Not anymore. This is, we've, we've gone full Greg bullshit at this point. So Colonel Haas is like, yeah, Greg, Good buddy, good pal. You're completely off the hook. Your girlfriend explained everything to me and like, I won't let anyone punish you. Also, it's like real cool that you're not one of those beta males, like all those guys over there. And you're like really cool, Greg. The Colonel then aggressively defends him to some guy outside of the room. And I don't know, you, you think the military would value discipline? You know, someone with enough self-control to not go full Hulk rage over some guy wanting to sleep with their girlfriend. Just, just a thought. So his girlfriend comes in all like bubbly and hyped. Like, oh my God, Greg, you chat. You ripped his eye out. It was so hot. Um, he touched my hip. He deserved it. And Greg's like, OMG, galaxy brain moment. I am right. I've been the moral one this entire time. I never start fights, I, even though I totally do. I just love them and take every opportunity I can to be as violent as I can. What's wrong with that? Chapter 19. Greg gets signed up for all kinds of super intense training by his new guardian angel, Colonel Haas. Basically, there's a Rocky montage and then suddenly he's a dangerous professional. Uh, but he gets back to Korea and ooh, drama, his girlfriend has a new roommate and it's Corey. Spicy. But then there's actually no drama because it's totally cool and Corey just loves him so much as a friend and his girlfriend just loves him so much too. And let's just have a session gushing about how much we love Greg because he's so great. So the new girlfriend tells Corey about the eye thing and she's like, OMG Greg, that's so cool. You're such a Chad. I feel so safe from gross men around you, which the fucking irony of him being a gross man who literally talked about gratifying himself to her every night. Out of absolutely nowhere, it's time to bring up the fact that his new girlfriend is vegan, but he loves her anyway, because he hated vegans before because of his dad, but now he realizes that love transcends diet. I want to die. So the girls start talking more about diets, you know, how women do, and <laughs> Greg gets triggered because it reminds him of his dad's diets, and um, he just, they don't want to stop talking about it, so he just sits there and angrily eats his steak, thinking, ha, ah, this is revenge on all the vegans who don't want me to eat steak. I'm just gonna angrily eat my steak. So Greg is out here volunteering for every possible assignment that he could get sent on. And finally, he gets sent to an active combat zone, again, referred to only so eloquently as the desert. Uh, Greg vomits on the plane there, and then he just has a miserable time for two weeks, not getting to murder anyone. He gets back to Korea. And he sees his girlfriend and Corey, and they are immediately just like, hey, wanna have a threesome? Oops, just kidding, we are gay for each other though. And Corey's like, just think about it, Greg. Of course I'm gay. That's the only possible explanation for a girl not wanting to sleep with you. So at first, Greg is, he's, he's hurt and betrayed by this. But then his girlfriend's like, no, Greg, it's okay. Like, we're still together. Like, it's fine. I'm just into her too. But like, obviously it doesn't count because she's a girl. And Greg's like, OMG, you're right before. I've had to fight everyone who tries to take my property. But if it's another girl, then it's hot and not at all a threat to me because same-sex relationships are nowhere near on the level that straight ones are. And then they all have a big group hug and everything is great and they all love each other so much. And then as Greg is leaving, they immediately, the two girls immediately start making out. And Greg is like, yeah, you know, gay rights. Like, things must be so hard for Corey. I just hate homophobes like my dad. You know, speaking of gay rights, I fantasize about them every night. I act like a gentleman, but I can't stop my perverted thoughts. My body demands that I spread my man seed. And Corey was just so touched by his acceptance of her being gay that just speaks to how evil and homophobic the rest of the world is compared to him. On behalf of lesbians, this entire chapter is disgusting and we do not want your fetishization masquerading as acceptance. Ew. I'm just, ew. That's, that's, I just feel ew right now. Chapter 21. 
So they're in a polyamorous throuple now and everything is beautiful all the time. If you're up on the onion lore, it's pretty clear which era this came from. Uh, it's also hilarious to me because obviously Greg never managed to achieve this beautiful harmonious ideal that he describes here. Because of course here they have an agreement that Corey is a lesbian, they just both sleep with the same girl. But Greg was a fucking creep and just wanted to sleep with all the girls his partner brought home. So that didn't really work out for them, did it? But they do watch each other have sex with their shared girlfriend all the time. The things that I read with my own two eyes for your entertainment. <laughs> Lord, my- oh god, my eyes are watering from that. I'm, I'm literally going to cry in this episode. The idea that any woman who is gay would want Onision watching them have sex is just so completely deranged. Oh my lord. The guy whose eye Greg ripped out gets gets wind of the fact that the, the two girls were holding hands. So now he's got blackmail material on them because this is during the, the don't ask, don't tell area of the military. So of course they could be discharged for being gay. He confronts them by coming over th to their lunch table and saying, so y'all just orgy all the time or what? Um, y'all are gonna burn in hell. <laughs> so we have this moment of like, ooh, Greg's gonna throat punch him. But no, we, we interrupt this scene for a very important message. Just a side note, you might think I'm horribly fat from eating all this meat, dot dot dot. It's not true. I weigh 178 pounds and I'm just an inch shy of six feet tall. Some people like my dad will have you believe that if you eat meat, that means you'll be obese. Who has ever said, okay. That's not always true. <laughs> Obviously, it's not the case for me. And opinions like that are especially ironic coming from a donut-obsessed, beer-bellied pile of lard like my father. And then from that, we just cut right back to the other guy storming out defeated after Greg flipped his lunch tray. That's some storytelling 101 right there. Be sure to always interrupt an intense moment to reassure the audience yet again that you are not fat. So, and then when they leave, the guy and three of his friends are like waiting outside the building for them and Corey's like, no, Greg, I can't leave you. And his girlfriend's like, it's okay. He's a combat expert and he's gonna throat punch them all. Then it's fine because security shows up and tells the guys to fuck off and then turns to Greg and is like, not that you needed the help because obviously you're just such a badass. This book started out like it was trying to be so edgy and now this is basically just the same narrator as Stones to Abigail. Basically the same concept of just guy walks around being a completely unself-aware asshole while everybody sucks his dick, literally and figuratively. And then he just has this hashtag deep moment of we're supposed to be fighting our country's enemies, but really we're just fighting each other. It's common sense that you shouldn't, but here you are. Chapter 22. Corey is getting discharged for being gay. For some reason, the girlfriend is fine. I guess if you calmly explain to them that you're bi, it's all chill. Cause they, they know about Corey because they saw the two of them together. So it doesn't, they're just, okay, whatever. Um, I don't, do I really expect a plot that makes sense from Greg? No, I do not. So what am I complaining about? So Corey comes to Greg crying and has countless tears running down her face. I, your first instinct when someone comes to you crying is to count their tears. That's interesting. <laughs> and Corey's like, I can't live without you. I need you to come back with me. Give this man the woke points for that believable gay representation. I want to die. There's some bullshit explanation for why the girlfriend isn't included in this. Apparently everyone believes she's straight because they saw her with him, but they also saw her with Corey. I don't think that homophobic military officials care if you're gay or bi, if they catch you like, okay. So then he explains, which this would be a way better explanation for why the girlfriend isn't included in this, but he just tacks this on as like a completely extra point that's not part of the bullshit explanation for that, which is fine, fine, it's fine, it's everything's fine. I had, <laughs> this is all a coordinated plot by one eye guy and his bros who apparently fabricated a bunch of stories about Corey being creepy and trying to seduce girls and yeah so they're they're trying to get her kicked out all for the purpose of ruining greg's life so greg immediately gets up to go do an alpha male thing so he storms over to the guy's room and he's like all right so i'm either gonna assault him and i can't pretend it was self-defense this time so i guess i'm gonna get kicked out but then i can go home with Corey, uh or i can intimidate him into admitting that he lies in which case she gets to stay either way i get to possess her so he just breaks down this guy's dorm room door uh, that he doesn't even check if it's unlocked first. That was just plan A is just bust in Kool-Aid man style. All right then. I admire the dedication. So he puts a knife to the guy's throat and is like, haha, 
I got a knife to your throat, and the guy is like, LMAO, dumbass, you want to go to jail for life? So then the guy's friend comes over and pulls Greg off of him, and is like, haha, your love triangle is over. Like, some kind of cartoon villain whose entire life is dedicated to ruining Greg's polyamorous military thruple. And then Greg just sulks away, like, oh, they're right. No matter what happens, I lose someone. Can't you see what a cry for help my violence is? I'm a tortured soul. Chapter 23. We're almost, we're so, the second to last chapter. We're so close. So one-eyed guy and his bro don't report what Greg did because Colonel Haas that guy who's protecting Greg won't even believe them anyway, so they don't bother because we live in Gregland where adults act like petty children. But Greg and Corey are just, they're just closer than ever these days and they just have a bond like nothing else he's ever experienced. The girlfriend is like kind of on the sidelines these days, but that's okay because she just had to go and be like some kind of selfish weirdo who focuses on her life goals instead of basing every sense of meaning she has on a relationship. What a weirdo. Greg just wants out of the army now so badly so that he can just go be with Corey and I just, I fucking hate this so much. Like literally just make her buy. As a lesbian, this is the absolute most fucking absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. So then Greg comes up with this genius plan that if he and Corey get married, then she can travel around with them in the military and it'll all be fine and dandy and the thruple can continue. And then he gives her a good brotherly kiss on the cheek and everything is just beautiful. So they're walking back to their rooms and one of one eye guy's pals is like, hey, Greg, Greggy Poo, my, my boy, my pal, come help me with something for a second. And Greg's like, all right, I guess. This doesn't look like a ploy to distract me from guys waiting to attack Rachel and Corey at all. Why are these guys so invested in ruining his life? Like, I mean, like maybe, maybe the guy whose eye he ripped out has some sort of retribution motive, but everyone else here is just, just in it for kicks. I'm just so, there's no reason for any of this. It's so fucking dumb. I'm just crying. I'm just crying over this stupid book. It's just so bad. Everything about this is bad and I want to die. Greg gets away from the guy who was trying to distract him and bursts into the girl's room and is like, well, I guess I gotta murder everyone in here now because they touched my property. He takes a second to, to shit on one eye guy for uh, solving his problems with violence as he murders an entire room of people himself. I mean, the final guy he even kills with his bare hands. Just as it looks like Greg has saved the day from Bad Guy McBad, yet again, the guy who now has no eyes thanks to him gets up again, even though he's been stabbed in the skull, he gets up again and he stabs Greg in the back of the head. Big reveal. Oh my god, what a plot twist. I am absolutely riveted. Corey decided to finish his journal after he died because that's a normal thing people do. So the final chapter is just like, I loved Greg so much and he was so great and so smart and so honest. And also she and Rachel are gonna name their adopted son after him because he was just such an inspiring person. She also then reveals that Greg was sexually abused by his father and that's why he hated him so much and that's why he was so violent. Okay, this is such a cop out just tacked on at the end so that the character can't be criticized. Therefore, I'm gonna do it anyway. And Greg's gonna make a response to this video like, wow, you think abuse victims should be mocked? You think abuse is funny? Oh my God, what an evil person who condones abuse. And I'm gonna let him. This final chapter basically exists to excuse every bad thing he did in this book and to obsess over how perfect and moral and good he was. You know, he, he maimed and murdered all those people, honestly, in the name of what he believed in, and that's just inspirational. He's also the only man she's ever loved. Put it back. I changed my mind about wanting more LGBT representation in media. Put it away. I don't want it. This is garbage. And that's that's basically how the stupid book ends. Also, that's that's it. It's over. What a journey, my friends. We got all of the narcissism and throat punches we love and expect from our Greggy Poo with a little bit a fetishization of queer women sprinkled on top that genuinely disgusts and disturbs me. But you know what? I can close my computer. I can close my computer and I don't have to think about it anymore. It's over and done and this video is filmed and he's gonna hate it and we're gonna have a good laugh. Thank you ever so much for watching my friends. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel. You can check me out on Patreon if you'd like to join my Discord server and come hang out or design one of my YouTube header images. A video on the third book and however many books Onion Boy decides to write in his lifetime will be made. Video on the third book definitely coming at some point this summer, but honestly these videos do take quite a bit of time, so not guaranteeing anything yet. Um, especially considering at the time that you watch this, I will be recovering from lung surgery. Just what a time. Oh god, what a time. <laughs> Are you just hiding so you don't have to laugh at me? Yeah. <laughs>
Ew. I'm not an onion fan. Yeah, I was gonna say No. I don't like onions. An onion has layers. Just like a lesbian with many jackets. Hashtag deep. <laughs> I'm gonna clean this, but. And maybe we could saute some onions.